humanity has yearned to understand itself and its relationship with its creator. In the days of Moses, the creator was known as the God of our forefathers or the God of Abraham, but there was no real name for the divine creative presence. Then one day, Moses, who was just a poor shepherd, came upon a burning bush, and yet the fire did not consume the bush. A voice spoke to him, saying that he must go unto the Pharaoh Ramses and demand the release of the Israelite slaves. When Moses asked who he should say sent him, God said, I am that I am. For the first time in history, God had a name. Armed with the power of God's name, I am that I am, Moses produced some of the greatest miracles of the Bible. Religious authorities, recognizing the name's awesome power, declared that uttering it was the highest blasphemy. And so its strength was unrealized, misinterpreted, and misunderstood. Moses never reached the Promised Land, nor did the code that could unlock the awesome power of God's name and set all of humanity free. A code that could set humanity free. It may seem impossible, but Moses learned something from God that day that changed the world. In fact, we still talk about the miracles he produced. When God gave Moses the name, I am that I am, there was a simple code that went with it that unlocked the true power and meaning of the words. But then the name of God was banned, and uttering it was sometimes even punishable with death. And so the code was lost. A code is a system of letters, numbers, or symbols that communicates information when converted into normal language. If the Moses Code could unlock the power of God's name today, is it possible that we would have the power to create miracles just like Moses did 3,500 years ago? For the first time, world-renowned scholars, psychologists, and philosophers will reveal the Moses Code and how you can harness its energy to change your life. Today we have the power to destroy the world many times over, but the Moses Code unleashes a new kind of power, one that creates worlds and helps us fulfill our individual and collective destiny. Incredibly, the Moses Code is far simpler than you may have imagined. Most of us were taught that the name given to Moses was, I am that I am. That doesn't make sense without the code. In reality, the name was much simpler. The Moses Code is a common symbol, something that we see and experience every day. The Moses Code is a comma. The Moses Code is a comma? A comma. I don't think so. I am that I am with a comma. We're not saying that the Moses Code is a comma. We're saying the Moses Code needs a comma. I am that. Comma. I am. The very name of God, I am that I am, has intrigued me for many, many years. When I was a child, I was told this by my, the adults around me. I am that I am, saith the Lord. And I thought, what in the world does that mean? I am that I am. Then one day a spiritual teacher said to me, I want you to change your life in 24 hours. I want you to walk down the street for 60 minutes today and I want you to look at everything you see and I want you to identify personally with that. Whatever it is, the grass, the flowers, other people, the wino, uh, the rich person driving by, the, sh the uh, chauffeur driven uh, uh, Cadillac, whatever it is, just look at it and say, I am that. And so I did that. I walked down the street. I was with a friend and I was saying in my mind, I am that, I am that, I am that. Whatever I looked at, if I saw violence on a TV screen, I am that. 
if I saw something beautiful happening in the park between a mother and a daughter, I am that. I was just saying that to myself and allowing myself to identify with all that is. And the friend that I was with looked at me and said, what are you doing? And I said, oh, I'm just saying I am that. She said to me, no, you're not that. You're not that, you're you. I said, no, no, I am that. You don't understand, I really am that. She said, no, no, you're you. You're really mixed up in your head. I said, listen to me, I am that, I am. And then I said, oh my God, did you hear what I just said? I just said, I am that, I am. The great name of God, I am that I am, has been misunderstood from the beginning of time. It's simply God's simple way, God's very human way of saying an enormous truth. I am that, I am. This is the presence of God saying, I am that. Everywhere you see, you see me. People used to say God is in everything. Really, everything is in God. God isn't just saying that I created that. God is this field, this presence that is everywhere in its fullness. God is saying, I am that. I am that. I am that person. I am that. I am that experience. I am that. I am ever of God. And so we, we have, you know, I am that I am is this man in the sky with a white flowing beard and these big long flowing robes. God made us in its image and we've been trying to return the favor ever since, meaning that we've made God in a man's image. And this I am that I am is out there, ready to decide capriciously whether to bless us or punish us for certain things. Now, of course, God can't be jealous because God's the only game in town. God is infinite, omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient. So there's nothing for God to be jealous of. So that was a primitive mindset projecting, projecting human emotions onto forces they didn't understand. And we project that presence outward instead of having a relationship with that present inwardly. If God actually is each one of us, then that would mean that each one of us is an embodiment of God. If that's true, then what would the possibilities be? What could we create? So we're walking to the wall now, where we're going to join thousands of other people encircling the entire old city of Jerusalem. But before we go there, we're going to explore three keys for unlocking the experience of being an embodiment of God, actually feeling in our bodies. And we're going to use three letters to do that, G-O-D, to help make it easier for us to remember. When these keys are applied to our lives, then we'll be able to turn that simple comma into one of the most transformative tools in history. The first key for experiencing ourselves as an embodiment of God is giving. We've all heard that it's better to give than to receive, but is that really true? And how can we give if we don't have enough ourselves? Mystics and saints like St. Francis said that it is in giving that we receive. Is that just a nice spiritual slogan? Well, you know, it really only comes down to one idea that's pretty far out. That which we give to others, that which we give to the world, we give to ourselves. So whatever one wants to experience in one's own life, one chooses to give away. Now, of course, the thought is, how can I give it away if I don't have it? Because the reason I'm trying to draw it to me is because I don't have it. But the very giving it to another is what causes you to realize you've had it all along. There's a part of your brain called the, in the, the Olympic brain that is not, is not time-oriented and it's not uh, object-oriented, meaning it can't tell the difference between itself and others, and it has no sense of past, present, future. That timeless and objectless place in my brain receives what I'm giving, because it doesn't know whether it's going out or whether it's coming in. Whatever it is that we are creating for someone else, our bodies experience it first. So when we offer the prayers or the thoughts, feelings, and emotions of a peace for our loved ones, uh, halfway around the world or, or between nations, we are experiencing that peace and that healing as well. And in, in this way, uh, once again, we see the example that giving truly is receiving. So, if you criticize other people, your brain doesn't know you're criticizing them, it receives it as if it was self-directed. If you care for and give to another person, that part of the brain doesn't know which way it's going, so it always receives. The brain always receives as a gift to itself, but is given to another person. We don't even have physical contact anymore. We don't look at each other because of technology. We barely see each other face to face. So we're missing that connection also. Make that connection. Give back to someone. Let that person cut in line. 
let that person in traffic. And I'm telling you, it just keeps, it, it'll flow, and you'll feel better for it. That there's a dimension about who we are that as a result of giving, that's the only way we make that connection. That's why my favorite book says, the greatest among you will be your servant. A servant is a giver. I think service is misunderstood in our culture because we confuse service with servitude or servant, which to the ego is offensive, it's demeaning, it's like I'm... But there is a saying, and I always have used it, to, to, to serve is to rule. To be able to be of genuine service really allows you to feel that your energy and your efforts make a difference. September 2001, I was in New York. I awoke to the news, and my friend that I was staying with, um, Doug, we went to the roof of his apartment building and watched the World Trade Center crumble. And both of us simultaneously looked at each other and, um, and said, we have to go down there right now. We were literally running against the current of people that were rushing out of the scene. We were running into the scene. Doug works in the media, so he had uh, media badges that allowed us to get beyond barricades that were just being set up by local police. There was still no support system for these firefighters and these rescue workers. So it became a real necessity that we find food and water really fast. So we um, actually, with, with the support of a couple of um, NYPD um, police officers, we started looting all the nearby delis and supermarkets. And we had turkey meats and we had the finest of New York delis meats and everything. After a while it became clear that there was just one food that all the um, rescue workers wanted and that was peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And I later um, realized that it was because it was comfort food. And it was the first area where they actually did the first roll call. Fire chief stood up on top of one of the crushed fire trucks. There were probably 400 names that he called off, and at least half of them were not present. As the reality set in with all of the firefighters around, that they were not present because they were not alive. They were in the building. Um, they started to literally crumble like dominoes all around us. They fell to their knees, they sat on curbs, and these big hardened men were just in tears. The earth movers came in to clear the way for all of the rescue vehicles, and Wall Street was lined with fine automobiles, so the only way to move them was to literally push them over with these earth movers. They just flipped the cars one at a time, all the way down the road, flipping cars out of the way. And, and I watched these, these material items go from being this beautiful car that I was drilling over to just being trash in seconds. We watched them, we just stood there, you know, like 12 guys going, oh my God, how can they do that? But then it became really clear to me that it's like, that was so irrelevant to the task of finding people alive that all of the material world was just garbage at that point. It didn't matter. I had suited up, you know, rescue workers' um, uniform, basically, with a respirator and everything on. And this actually ended up becoming my pass to get into the ground zero, where it was nothing but qualified rescue workers. And here I was, just a civilian with really no qualification to be there. So the first victim that was um, found was this little man in a suit, and he had been completely crushed and disfigured under a um, fire truck. And I, I, and I stood there looking at him and imagining what his story must have been, that he, he likely hit under the thing that felt the most secure, like a fire truck. Do you know what I mean? He probably crawled under that fire truck as debris was falling, only to be crushed under that fire truck when that entire rig was crushed upon him. And so that was really the first sobering moment of, wow, okay, this is what we're here for, and this is what we're going to witness, and am I up for it? And you know, it was, I didn't really even have to think about it. It was just a yes. We have to understand that when we perform service for others, we're not really doing that. I mean, it looks like in the illusion that we're doing that, that we are serving others, but the truth is there's no one else to serve but the, the self. There's nothing going on in the world except self-service. ...is not strictly for getting in return. You know, there's not this intellectual thought of, okay, well, I'm going to give to you, you, and you, because if I do, then maybe I'll get something. Most of us operate in that mode already. Moses didn't do that. He just gave and received and served. We want to give as God gives, without expectations, without wanting anything in return, just to connect with another person, to serve in the grandest way. Greatness is your capacity and your willingness to be of service. Service to what? Service to love. 
service to peace, service to beauty, service to God, service to joy. I think that when we do that, when we take our attention off all of our problems and all of our circumstances, and we put it on somebody else, it's the thought of doing that that allows us to lose track of ourselves and lose track of our problems, and that's an act of creation. Recently, I was inspired by my own son, Bo, who was having a bar mitzvah. And the rabbi explained to him that the mitzvah was really in the stretch, going beyond what he felt comfortable doing. What kind of challenges do you feel like uh, you faced and that you had to overcome to, uh, to do this great mitzvah? I'm giving away all my money, so that's always hard. What kind of project are you going to do? Uh, I'm raising money to build a school in a poor part of Uganda. He decided that he would build a school. An entire school? Yeah, a seven-room schoolhouse. And donate 100% of his money. So Moses did exactly the same thing you're doing, Bo. He left his comfort zone to do something good for people that desperately needed it. The village where Bo's project is going to be built is called Chico Iro. And the difference between a child going to school and not going to school is really the difference between life and death for many children. It says, Bo, I've decided to put my money towards the school. We've received money from over 500 people. That's great. How old is she? She's only 12. That's weird. No, I think that's beautiful. I know. That's awesome. They were just ecstatic, and they really got that this was a child helping children. How does it feel to be a philanthropist? Uh, what's a philanthropist? <laughs> this has been a tremendous opportunity, not just for the children of Chico Iro, but for also for kids in the U.S. to get the idea that there's more that they can do. There are some people that don't have the capacity to receive the good that wants to come into their life, and they end up becoming martyrs. They end up burning themselves out because they give, but they never replenish themselves through being available to the presence expressing through them through receptivity. The couples who proceed slowly in therapy, the couples who seem to never get there, and no matter what happens in the relationship, they just don't, quote, really improve, have what we call a defense against receiving. They have no receptors for letting stuff in, not only letting love in, but letting compliments in, letting uh, positive statements in, letting appreciation in. To surrender yourself enough to be able to receive, first from God, the Holy Spirit, and then from those around you, I think is one of the most sacred acts that we perform. The, the complete whole state is, a, is an individual that gives with ease and with grace. They're here to give, to share their gifts, their time, and their talents, their capacities, while at the same time they're in tune with the fundamental order of existence, their real being, and they're receptive to this flow through them. They can receive love, they can receive intuitive hits, they can receive wisdom and guidance, they can receive the, the beauty that is everywhere, so there's a complete cycle, and ultimately giving and receiving receiving are one. Most of us have heard prophets and sages and enlightened beings say that we're all one. But we look out at the world and we see separation everywhere. So how can that be true? Does that mean that I'm one with Jack the Ripper as well as Mother Teresa? Does that mean that I'm one with you? Are these just airy-fairy ideas? Or could this be the next step in all of us realizing that we're actually an embodiment of God. The fundamental principle that you find encoded in all major religions, all authentic spiritual paths, is this spiritual idea called oneness. That we are at one with life, we're at one with the presence of God, we're at one with each other. We find that in all the traditions. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. One presence, one power. The Atman, the Buddha nature, you know, the, the Christ had won. It's in quantum physics. Rupert Sheldrake, the unified field, one presence everywhere. This oftentimes doesn't seem to square with physical evidence, primarily because the average individual sees the world through the filter of a sense of separation. They see the world through their senses. And if you're more in the ego, then you're going to sense 
survival fear, this angst that you've got to get yours, that it's all about getting, 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 getting. Through spiritual practices, you go beyond the sensory realm and you enter into a field where you see, not with eyesight, but with insight, that everything is connected. The scientists, the quantum scientists would call it a unified field that is everywhere in its fullness, that is undivided. That's what being awake means, is to say, well, I'm dancing in this illusion of separateness, but I'm not separate. For once an individual is broken through, then all the things on the surface that seem separate begin to work together for our good because we're now in tune with everything on the invisible level. So you end up working not harder, which you end up working a lot cleaner, a lot easier, because you're in tune with all of life. So you're not trying to make something happen on the surface, you're trying to make something welcome on the invisible side of life. So oneness is the primary principle, it's the, it's the, it's the linchpin of power. We're at one with God, one with love, one with life, one with all the power that there is. Until we're willing to embrace the totality of our humanity and our divinity, we can never be in oneness because we're taught to say, I'm not that. We're taught to say, you know, I, don't, I see something I don't like, so I don't want to be that. And we push that part of ourselves aside. And at times, all of us, including myself, at times find it hard to be at one with someone or some ones that either don't agree with us or that have values that uh, would be totally, we believe to be totally destructive. These days, I'm having a lot of trouble with phony people. And I can see that I don't like that part of myself, that I'm always searching for ways to be more authentic and more real and show more of myself, even as a teacher. I finally went to take my first nap in 40 hours, 40 plus hours. I really don't know, it was kind of timeless there. And I found an apartment building that had been completely abandoned. And so I went into the lobby of this apartment building and. Um, and I found a couch and I dusted it off and I laid down on the couch with my face against the back of the couch and I, and I cuddled up and I bundled up and, and probably about a half hour into um, my sleepless nap, um, I could feel the little man, the first victim that we found, the little man in the suit, I could feel him kneeling behind me and I could see it vividly. He was kneeling behind me his disfigured face, staring at the back of my head. I could feel his breath on the back of my neck. And I was pretty, pretty terrified. And I just lay, laid there for, I don't know how long it was, five or 10 minutes just thinking, what is he doing? And I was still and quiet long enough for that voice, that, you know, that voice, whatever you want to call it, my internal voice, that said to me very loud and clearly, this could be your Vietnam or dot, dot, dot. And it just left me kind of hanging like that. I didn't know what the dot, dot, dot was, but I knew what the, this could be your Vietnam meant. Having grown up, seeing all of the ex-vets with all of their um, drama that they've brought back from the war and their flashbacks, having just had my first ground zero flashback, I knew that this could be something that could stay with me that way for the rest of my life and it could probably trouble my future. Or, and I knew that the answer to the or was back out on the rebel. So I got up and I suited up again and I put my mask on and I, and I walked around the building and as I rounded the corner, they had put up a new work light and it was this very bright, brilliant light. And everything just seemed so bright and so brilliant that I was like just struck. And I, I just looked around at all these people and everything, everything just instantly appeared different to me. And I stood there with tears in my eyes. It felt like I was just, it, the world was in slow motion. I was watching people go by and all I could see was just spirits crossing and spirits working and chain gangs of spirits. And it was so clear to me that everything was interconnected and it was all one big body of God. Everybody had dropped their egos, they had dropped their identities, they had dropped their rank, and they were working together for the greater good of all. And I was so lit up with possibility for humankind. 
of what it can be like when we all are working together in this way. And I could really get beyond concept what oneness was. Knowing that the entire world was experiencing what it was experiencing, all the separation and fear and chaos that was going on in the world, here I was standing there experiencing the greatest bliss and beauty of my life. And I just, I remember just wishing that the world could see this situation through my eyes. When I first decided to be on this spiritual journey, I was really looking to become a better me. And my sister always told me that I was angry and I was selfish and self-absorbed and these whole, whole list of characteristics that I didn't want to be. So I started working on becoming this nice person. And I learned how to talk in a nice voice. And I learned how to give things away that I had if you wanted them. I did all these things. And then I went to a seminar one day and I'm standing there and everybody's looking at me. In the middle of the seminar, this woman shouts out, you're a bitch. And I thought, well, I know that. How does she know? And she said to me, let me ask you something, Debbie. If you were remodeling a house and you were six weeks late and $20,000 over budget, do you think it might help to be a little bitchy? And all of a sudden, a light went on, because I thought if I just got rid of all my bad qualities, and believe me, I have plenty, that somehow that would make me a good person. The piece I was missing is that every dark quality of mine came bearing gifts. And you can go down the list, things that we see that are very negative oftentimes have the effect of taking us to the next stage of our evolution. You take somebody like a George Bush, he was an evolutionary trigger. He's, he's galvanized the peace movement, parts of the peace movement that had never spoken to each other in many years, since the 60s. He comes along with a war ethic and a preemptive strike war ethic, peace movement starts talking. So he actually was a, as a, as a, as a very positive force for the evolution of many positive things on the planet. See, if I want to grow and evolve spiritually, I have to take my projection off of them and own and embrace that part of myself. We have to be lovers of humanity. We have to be lovers of ourself and even seek to love that which our ego or our mental perception would say, you know what, I can't love that. I'm a phony bitch. Now the question is, how am I going to love myself being a phony bitch? Go within and embrace it anyway. And even as I say this, they're probably going to bleep me out because nobody can bear that they might be a phony bitch. So then they've got to shut me down and we all have to pretend like we're not that. People get confused in this conversation because they'll say, well, I'm not a murderer or I'm not a rapist. But I would say, find out what kind of person would be a murderer. What kind of person would be a rapist? Those are the questions that we must ask ourselves, because maybe a rapist would be somebody who's wounded or sick. We all have a wounded part of ourselves. We all have a sick part of ourselves. We all have a twisted part of ourselves. And even though we'd like to fit into the ego's ideal of being a perfect human being, we're not. We're all that there is. And when we can open our hearts and have compassion for the part of us that might murder. We have no idea that if we're capable of that, especially if we're living and watching this film. But maybe, maybe in the right or wrong circumstances, we are all capable of anything. The most beautiful, glorious act of greatness and what we would consider one of the most horrible crimes against humanity. And when we embrace all of ourselves, knowing that we're both human and that we are divine, well, voila, all of a sudden you have a whole human being, and what you feel is oneness. I was married to a woman who was in so many ways the embodiment of all the things we're talking about. Linda has always been such an inspiration for me, and I know for so many other people, because of her kindness and her beauty. When my daughter and I were in Minnesota with family, we woke up the next morning to hear that uh, two men had broken into her apartment and had killed her. The anger and the grief and the, the profound sadness for me was overwhelming. My daughter and I and a couple of others, we were talking and crying. It was very late at night and my cell phone was beeping because the battery was 
was wearing down and so I, I just hit the button to turn the power off but for the first time it didn't go off something very different happened and the one and only picture that I had of Linda on my phone flashed full screen and froze there and, and we felt her so profoundly connected with us and it was in that moment that I felt this profound shift within me even toward these men who had killed her for me the powerful emotion that I felt over and over again was was this connection, this compassion for people who must have gone through something truly terrible to have committed such a terrible crime against a woman who was so beloved and so cared for by everyone that knew her. And there was a song that I wrote and performed at her funeral, and it was a way of both healing my heart but also imagining what Linda would say from the other side of the veil if she could reach back and speak to us about oneness. And if ever you forget me, just call me by my name, and my soul, it will answer time and time again. find me deep within you in the one if you have a spiritual practice when those insights occur they integrate into your way of living they don't wipe you out nor that they just fade into the recesses of memory as to a wonderful moment you once had, integrates into you. And that sense of oneness and unity becomes more real than anything. Do you have a destiny? Moses believed that his destiny was to lead the Israelites out of Egypt into the promised land. Well, on the other hand, Forrest Gump felt that life is like a box of chocolates and you never know what you're going to get. It can be a little scary trying to tackle an idea so big, but it might be worth another look since the final key to experiencing yourself as an embodiment of God is to uncover your deepest yearning and your reason for living. The calling is always upon us. There's always something within us that wants to become conscious of itself as us. It's called the next stage of our evolution. There's something within all of us that we must express. So Moses represents you and me, an ordinary person on an ordinary day having an extraordinary experience, where Moses climbs a mountain and there he has an encounter with a presence that shows up as this flame and a bush that is burning, but the bush won't be consumed meaning that the source of this presence isn't in the material realm. The source of this presence comes from and is presencing that which is divine and eternal. And Moses doesn't know quite what to do with this, as either you or I would do. It's, he knows there's something in him that knows this is about to completely transform his life. Now, I consider myself a, a fairly spiritual person. But if I was sitting here today and the bush were to start burning, in my mind, I'd go get the fire extinguisher. <laughs> the bush is always glowing. I had an opportunity to be with a, a, a powerful shaman in, in Africa a, f a few years ago. And we were traveling at night. And I was kind of stumbling. And they were just walking through the jungle like it was daylight. And we went out to a clearing and had this very powerful uh, experience out there. And after the experience, everything was lit up. Everything was aglow with this fire. The leaves were on fire, the ground was on fire. Everything was aglow. And I was aware that these individuals that were taking me through the jungle, they were seeing like this. They had this night vision that allowed them to see the luminosity from all of nature. And in that instant, I had the same thing. I had that kind of a spiritual night vision that allowed me to see that everything was ablaze with the Spirit of God. And I thought about Moses seeing the burning bush 
At that moment, he was in transcendent awareness that he could see clearly that God is everywhere and everything is aglow with this fire, this power and this presence. Moses was having a good day. <laughs> when Moses asks the bush, asks this flame, asks this presence, who are you? He hears, I am that I am. And we don't know whether the conversation is actually audible in human terms or it's a transmission from the knower that is everywhere present into his heart. But nevertheless, this communication says something. And the communication is this, there is a journey that you are to take. Joseph Campbell would later call that the hero's journey. That there's a journey that is for each one of us to take, that takes us from our local, temporal, egoistic point of view or self to an understanding, a person of destiny, a person of wholeness and completeness, and that journey is the Moses journey. Moses didn't think he was worthy, and so that, that unworthiness combined with willingness provided a space for the presence of God to come through because Moses wasn't blocking God out with his ego. So the rest of the story is both a literal story, a historic story, but it's also a meta story. It's a story of you and the story of me. And all the characters in that story are parts of ourselves. So Moses is then told that he must go and free the slaves. And he is to take them to the promised land or to fulfillment, to the land of milk and honey. And he questions, I can't do this. I mean, he stutters, he can't speak well. He's like, who am I to do this? And you and I feel the same way when a dream, an idea, a, a, a calling, something calls to us about make a difference, give something, do something in your local community, do something for the world, do something for your family, do something. And right away we feel like, oh, I'm not up to it. I don't have what is required. I'm not enough for that. I think everyone has to come to grips with the fact that if there's a, there's, there's a destiny within all of us, there's something calling all of us, and we are presently not the person that can deliver that destiny. We grow into it as we say yes to it. There's an old statement that God does not uh, call the qualified, God qualifies the called. So that when we answer that call, then the presence qualifies you. It qualified me. I didn't have all of the skills, I didn't have the resources, I didn't have the money, I didn't have the space, didn't have anything. But God qualified me through my yes. So people showed up, resources showed up, buildings showed up, uh, individuals who could catch the vision that I was articulating showed up, and then I changed, I grew. So the person that said yes is not the same person sitting here today. The person that's sitting here today saying yes to the next stage of the vision will not be the person that inherits and articulates and manifests that aspect of the vision. We're constantly evolving and growing and unfolding based on our ability and our willingness and our capacity to say, yes, I'm willing, yes. And so Moses agrees to the journey. And there's that part of us that says yes to our own destiny, that says yes to our purpose as we discover it. And then, of course, comes having to encounter Pharaoh. Not only the historic Pharaoh, but the, the personal Pharaoh. The, the personal Pharaoh is our intellect. It's the part of us that's all made an agreement with the kingdom of our lives as we've known it, with everything just as it is, the status quo, the comfort zone. And then there's this part of us that wants to emerge, this part of us that wants to make a difference. And there's a whole argument that goes on internally about, no, I'm not about to make that change. And ultimately, in this story, which is your story and my story, the hero's journey, the trouble builds up, the trouble gets tougher, things get more and more complicated. And finally, in desperation, Pharaoh says, okay, Go ahead, take the people and go. Now, the thing that I find very interesting about Moses is that he had a speech impediment. We don't know what kind it was, but one might think, why would God choose someone with a speech impediment, let's say a stutter, to deliver 400, 4,000, however many, unruly Israelites into a new way of being? So here they are fussing and arguing among themselves, and, and Moses with his speech impediment, you would say, why does God have such a sense of humor? And you'd say, why would he choose Moses? One of the reasons why God could use him is because of his, his humility. And oftentimes, uh, people that seem that they're lacking something within themselves, they become great vessels and great vehicles for the power of God to express through because there's nothing to inhibit the flow from expressing through them. 
Very often we think we have impediments or limitations, and we don't think God can use us, but God will take your limitation and use you and it to deliver somebody else into a new place and a new way of being. So the sea opens, and then the real journey begins because they spent 40 years in the desert. Which is in the Bible and in many of the mystical traditions, 40 is symbolic of simply this, the amount of time required for transformation. Noah has 40 days in the flood. Jesus has 40 days on the Mount of Temptation. Moses has 40 years in the desert. It's the amount of time required for the transformation. And for some of us, this is our 40th moment right now. Watching this right now, we know that this is the moment when the life we've lived is not sufficient to the purpose that we're being called for. I think it's useful for us to understand why the soul came to the body. Now, the soul came into physicality in order that it might experience itself, express itself in the physical world as who it really is, thus to know itself in its own experience. So the fear is that if we identify the I am that I am with the I am that I am, that somehow it makes us pretending to be something we're not being or taking on something. But what if it's just the opposite? What if by saying that I am an opportunity for the I am that I am to presence divine love through my hands this day to a child that I'm teaching or to an old person I'm helping carry the groceries or to someone that I call who's in pain or hurting in some way and I'm the voice that comforts them. What if when we give ourselves just the possibility that if we allow ourselves the I am that I am might be an avenue through which the I am that I am that is God, that is the presence, that is the power of life itself might find a way, an entry point to make a difference for good right here on planet Earth. Ah, oh, but we got to be careful here because when the ego starts to think that it's God, it just gets arrogant, it gets greedy, it takes us over completely. It's not a pretty picture. We have to dip into our soul, to our essence, in order to be all that there is. The difficulty is this. We're a mixture of a constellation of different identities that have emerged for different reasons. We're mothers, we're fathers, we're brothers, we're sisters, uh, we're employers, we're employees. There's, there's all kinds of identities and every single identity is pulling upon our energy for its survival. However, there is a central identity which is the I am presence. There's a central identity which is not in comparison with all other identities or in comparison with anybody else. It's the image and likeness of God. It's a unique configuration of infinite potential, infinite possibility. And within that core identity, it is speaking, it's calling our real name and inviting us to greatness. It's inviting us to be more ourself. Remember, it's the still small voice. We have to get quiet enough to hear it. And through spiritual practice of prayer, lowly listening, meditation, after a while you're able to tell the difference between the voice of one of the constellation of shifting identities or the true voice that's coming from your soul that wants you to be great. And the definition of greatness is your capacity and your willingness to serve. When we get past survival, when we get past those small-minded things, then the only thing the soul wants to do is to uh, make a difference, to, to give to humanity. What can I do? There's so much you can do, you can't even believe it. Right at the end of your fingertips is a whole world of your possible creation. And it is ignited, it is inspired, it is embraced, and it is in fact experienced in extraordinary ways the moment you decide to be in service not just to the world, but to the world of your own creation. When that central voice begins to speak, and it's still, and it's small, it's calling you to a greater degree of service, and a greater degree of serving humankind, a greater degree of serving your family, a greater degree of serving everyone you come in contact with. That's one of the ways you can tell the difference between that voice. Is it calling you to serve, or is it calling you just to take care of yourself? It's calling you just to take care of yourself. It may be coming from the ego. The question often uh, rises for us, so how do I know the difference between God's will and my will, and do I have a will, what do I do with my will? And um, My understanding of that is that, well, where is God? 
Jesus said the kingdom of God is within you. So within us, we know we have the pharaoh part of the intellect or the part of us that argues for circumstances that we know. And then there's the prophetic part. Or there's the part of us that does have a destiny, that does have a call to make a difference for good. And so when we align the pharaoh with the heart, then we align our will with God's will. When we enact creation, we are uh, emulating the creator. And the result of that is that we feel good. We feel love. We feel expanded. Your soul needs inner peace. It needs contentment, love, creative expression, and of course, divine connection. Those are the qualities that make you feel good. You're actually wired so that you'll know you're on track by the aliveness you feel. I am that I am. And it's in your being, your embracing of the presence and standing in that that you give the greatest gift that you can to the world. And so the understanding about that and the living from that is the journey. Of Course in Miracles calls it the 18-inch journey from the head to the heart. In that moment, standing there, overlooking ground zero and all the chaos that was going on arose my, my life destiny. All my selfish pursuit of trying to get what I needed to get and be where I needed to be in my life just seemed ridiculous. I knew that from that point on, my life would be about all of us. It would be about community. My heart was so filled with possibility of what we're capable of when we're working from that point. Because I know it's possible, my whole life now has been about recreating that community. It is the, the catalyst for my wanting to create Elevate Film Festival, which is, when you really break it down, it's just a community of people who understand this oneness that I'm talking about. Can we bring people into an experience that's so much bigger than who we think we are, that we can experience that level of oneness? Because when you do, there, there's nothing more beautiful in this lifetime and this experience. There's nothing greater than that. The kingdom of God is unconditional love. The kingdom of God is peace of mind. The kingdom of God is joy in my soul. I said, yeah, let me seek that stuff. And then I don't have to worry about getting anything, being with anybody, doing anything special. Let me go for the unconditional love, first of myself, and then to be able to extend it to everyone else. Let me go for the peace of mind, where I'm not worrying about what might happen, what could happen, where I'm just embracing the presence, my I amness, the manner of God in this right now moment. Let me go for that, and let that trickle down and fill every other aspect of my life. That's the kingdom. To that degree that we begin to know who we are, that who I am behind my eyes is the same person that you are behind your eyes. And that's the kingdom and that's the connection that connects all of us. And as we get closer to that, then we begin to manifest the attributes of that in our life and our daily living. So once I really understood what the kingdom was, oh yeah, oh yeah, baby, I want to seek that. <laughs> So paradoxically in that moment, while the world was experiencing chaos and confusion and fear, I was standing there experiencing my first true experience with God through giving and a service that I was witness to. I had experienced the oneness, the greatest sense of oneness that I ever knew was possible. And from that arose my destiny. Now that we understand the three keys for experiencing ourselves as an embodiment of God, now it's time for us to consider what we can create from that new experience. If saying and being, I am that, I am, really can unlock the power of God within us, the next question is, well, how extensive is that power? Can we move mountains and create miracles like Jesus and Moses? Are these just fantastical ideas or can they really change the world? 
I is the creative factor of the universe, and when you add am to it, what you get is the movement of the creative force of the universe. So every time you say I am, you are creating, you are creating movement. Think of it this way. We say I am broke. Yes, and that's how you stay. I am lonely. Yes, and that's how you stay. But if we were to begin to use the creative force and energy of that name I and the movement of am to say I am whole, I am holy, I am complete, I am beautiful, I am gorgeous, I am wealthy, I am, we begin energy moving in our life and we re-educate our souls. That's all Moses had to do was to bring that oneness, that creative energy of God and put an action to it. And Pharaoh had no choice but to back down. He recognized what he was dealing with. He was able to take the I am presence and lift up an entire nation to see who and what they really were and whose they really were. There's actually a way to activate this creative energy through a process that we can practice every day. And the great thing about this process is that it applies to almost every area of our life. And you can remember it with five simple words. And guess what the words are? The only thing that changes is what you focus on when you say those words. The first step is to imagine what you want to be, do, or have, and really make sure that it's something that matters. And the second step is to repeat the words, I am that, I am, and allow yourself to expand into that new possibility. So if we want to have a new way of being, we must say it and repeat it time and time and time again. When we repeat things, we encode them in our consciousness. The third step is pretty easy. In fact, you're already doing it. It's to breathe. Controlled breathing centers you, energizes you, and actually amplifies the effect. One way to practice this is to say, I am that on the out breath, and then as you breathe in, either think or say the words, I am, like this. I am that. I am. I am that. I am. This simple process takes whatever you're feeling and imagining and projects it out into the world so that you can experience it in your real life. One of the ways I like to support people in doing this is by thinking about the qualities that inspire you, the qualities that you desire. See somebody, maybe you know them or maybe you've read about them in your awareness. Bring that image of them very close to you and then just close your eyes and start repeating, I am that I am. Really allowing yourself to encode that image, that way of being and those qualities right into yourself. I am the joy I want to experience. I am the peace I want to experience. I am the beauty I want to realize. I am the abundance I want to realize. And through the power of that declaration, through the flow of that kind of energy, it manifests in and as your life. When we talk about manifestation or getting stuff, no, we want two cars, three houses. You got one butt. Why do you need four cars? <laughs> I could say the same thing about shoes. I've got two feet, I've got 80 pairs of shoes. But it's manna to my soul. <laughs> but it, manifestation it, it, of things is not the same thing as manna, the presence of God that supplies your every need. There are some people that are dominated uh, by the ego and they try to get. Uh, they, they, they try to use the principles for acquisitiveness, to get things, and they hoard, and inside they're very poor people. They may have a lot of stuff, but they're just poor people with a lot of stuff. Advanced students understand that it works exactly the opposite, not to try to magnetize something to us, but to try to bring something through us. Many people say, I just don't know who I am. They don't know their soul. They don't know their soul. And it's great. People think they can reach out, get the cars, the jobs, the best relationships, the money. People, all, people get that and more power to them. But they'll st they still say to themselves, I still feel empty. What's missing? You forgot about the soul. And that's really what we want. We want the grace and the majesty and the, and the presence of God to so fill us until it's unspeakable. Because if we can speak it and call it something, we'll try to fix it and change it. So we just want to be. And in that beingness, we have the manna, which is the manifestation of the presence of God. And it's not about a car or a house. 
It's about the presence of God. Truly embodying the God presence isn't just about being saintly and having this upward connection to the divine that we would call mystical and enlightened, but it also requires that we fully inhabit our bodies and fully be in our sensuality, our sexuality, and really combine and fuse those energies. Love is God, God is love. So you are God, you are love. And when you use that energy of love, God will always say yes. It will manifest exactly what you want. So if you can access that feeling of oneness or the energy of wholeness, what Jesus calls the kingdom of heaven within you, then you can begin to experience that all around you in the world. But if we have an idea that something other than the kingdom of God is something we would seek after, then we will create, because we are so powerful, we will create in our own illusion that which is not of the heaven of which we dream. That is, we'll create our own hell on earth. Moses and the Code never made it to the Holy Land, and since then Israel has been in constant conflict. Millions have lost their lives due to a misinterpretation of the name of God, and religious factions have been fighting for centuries, ironically, in the name of God. But thousands of people of all races and religions are flying in from all corners of the world, armed with the powerful intent to finally bring peace to the Holy Land by literally embracing the old city of Jerusalem. At the time of the hug and before, it is important for us to keep our pure intention and relax. So we're walking to the wall now, where we're going to join thousands of other people encircling the entire old city of Jerusalem. Can you stretch the line? Keep <laughs> We're here facing the, the wall, so as you breathe out, you say, I am that, meaning I am that peace in Jerusalem. Feel the peace radiating from this city. And so, 3,500 years later, Moses' journey is complete by delivering the true meaning of the name of God to the Holy Land. It began with a conversation, but continues today through each one of us. The door has been unlocked. Now it's up to us to step into a new world.
going to tell you a story, and this one you can repeat. I saw God the other day, just walking down the street. I said, hold on just a minute. How do I know it's really you? She gave me a simple answer. She said, you don't unless you do. Wait a minute. I don't quite understand all this. Tell me, what do you want with me? You see, I'm not a religious type of person. And he said, you don't have to be. She looked like you. He looked like me.